are singularly prone to lust. They abstain from intercourse with foreign women. Among themselves, nothing is unlawful. Circumcision was adopted by them as a mark of difference from other men. And those who come over to their religion adopt that practice and have as a first lesson instilled into them to despise all gods, to disown their country, and to reject their parents, their children, and their brethren. This is a long quote, but what we see in this spiteful caricature is a culmination of 400 years of anti-Jewish propaganda, which we find in many written sources from the preceding centuries. And what is so striking about this literature is that not only the first instances known to us are from Alexandria, but also several of the other instances derived from this city. I will pass briefly some of them in review. The first Egyptian intellectual to write in Greek was an Alexandrian priest named Maneto, early 3rd century BC. In his work on Egypt, on Egyptian history, he tells about a the pharaoh's wish to see the gods, a wish that could be fulfilled only if he purified the whole land of lepers and other polluted persons. He collected several tens of thousands of such people and sent them to the quarries. Then the polluted, polluted people joined forces with the lepers and revolted under the leadership of a priest called Osarsif, whom at the end, however, Maneto identifies as Moses. This priest made it a law that they should neither worship the gods nor refrain from killing any of the sacred animals in Egypt, but that they should sacrifice and consume them, and that they should have contact with, no bond, with nobody except those of their own group. He decreed a great number of laws that were fully opposed to Egyptian customs, and then asked the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who were old enemies of the Egyptians, to join them in an attack on Egypt. Not only did they set villages and the towns on fire, pillaging the temples, and mutilating images of the gods without restraint, but he also used the sanctuaries as kitchen to roast the sacred animals. They even compelled the Egyptian religious officials to sacrifice their own sacred animals and afterwards cast them naked out of their temples. So this brutal regime was characterized by misanthropy and by hatred of the Egyptian religion. But fortunately, after some time, this regime of terror was expelled by the pharaoh and the criminals settled in Palestine. Such, says this Alexandrian priest, were the origins of the Jewish people. Although there can be no doubt that older Egyptian stories dealing originally with the reigns of terror by Semitic peoples like the Hyksos in Egypt have been applied here by Maneto only secondarily to the Jews, it is clear that what we have here is an anti-Jewish version of the Exodus story. Here, no story of liberation from Egypt by God. On the contrary, it was the gods who commanded that these polluted persons of extreme impiety be expelled from their land. And this is the motive that will recur from this time on in a wide variety of versions, as we have already seen in Tacitus. I now skip a passage for reasons of time. Um, and summarize briefly what we find in subsequent authors where you see that impiety and misanthropy have now become stock elements in anti-Jewish propaganda in Alexandria. And we see that again in the first centuries of the common era at the time of the pogrom, when Apion, a philologist of Egyptian origin, attacks the Jewish people so viciously and becomes so influential that several decades later, after his death, the Jewish historian Josephus still finds it necessary to devote a whole work to the refutation of the slanders of this Jew hater. Apart from the elements that have become familiar by now, the anti-Jewish versions of the Exodus, a new detail is added by Apion. This is the story that King Antiochus entered the Jerusalem temple and, I now quote, he found there a couch 
on which a man was reclining, with a table before him laden with a banquet of fish and beasts of the earth and birds of the air, at which the poor man was gazing in stupefaction. The king's entry was hailed by him as to procure profound relief for him. Falling at the king's knees, the man implored him to set him free. The king asked him to tell him who, who, he, who he was and what was the meaning of this abundant dish. Thereupon the man told in a pitiful tone the story of his distress. He said that he was a Greek and that while traveling around in this country, he was suddenly kidnapped and brought to the temple and shut up there. He was seen by nobody except by servants who treated him on abundant meals. At first this unexpected advantage seemed a pleasure, but after a while it made him suspicious. And at last he inquired of the servants what was going on and was informed that it was in order to fulfill a secret law of the Jews that he was being fattened. They did the same at a fixed time every year they used to catch a Greek foreigner, fatten him up for a year and then lead him to a wood, kill him, sacrifice his body with it, their customary ritual and partake of his flesh. While immolating the Greek, they swore an oath of hostility to all Greeks. We should keep in mind that it was this man, Apion, who during the reign of Caligula was not only honored by the city of Alexandria with citizenship, but that the city also asked him to act as leader of the Greek Alexandrian delegation to Rome in the conflict between Greeks and Jews in 38. If this man was so prestigious that the Greeks decided to confer citizenship upon this Egyptian, it should not surprise us that his incredible accusation of Jewish cannibalism and eating a Greek at that was taken seriously and believed by the Greeks. It will certainly have shown a lot of hatred. Let me add some remarks on what other Greek or Roman authors say about the Jewish belief in one God. What struck them more than anything else is that the Jewish God is an iconic, has no image, which is contrary to the customs of the Greeks and Romans. And since this deity without image is invisible, the conclusion is often drawn that the Jews do not recognize any God at all and are atheists. Since the Jews differ from all other peoples in this respect, it is said that this contributes to their xenophobic lifestyle. More than, a, more than one ancient author condemns the Jews, therefore, as both atheists and misanthropes, and others comment upon the arrogance that goes hand in hand with the exclusiveness of Jewish monotheism. The separatism that this entails is clearly worded by a 3rd century CE historian, Cassius Dio, who says that the Jews are distinguished from the rest of mankind in practically every detail of life, but especially by the fact that they do not honor any of the gods, but show extreme reverence for only one particular god. We have to draw to a close. What happened in Alexandria in the roughly three centuries preceding <coughs> the pogrom was a complex process. It would be unwise to speak of a mono, of, in the simplifying terms of a monocausal model. First, there was the long-standing tradition of Alexandrian anti-Semitism. We do not know whether the Alexandrians were incited to produce their anti-Jewish versions of the Exodus story because they read the Greek translation of the Jewish Bible and reacted to the anti-Egyptian version of the story it contained, or rather through hearsay. We do not know that. Whatever is the case, the bitter antagonism that these anti-Jewish versions bespeak from the very beginning linges on from the start of the Hellenistic period till far into the Roman times. On top of that come the many stories of Jewish separatism, hatred of Egyptian civilization that was gradually widened to hatred of mankind in general until it reached its bizarre final stage, stage with the accusation of an annual cannibalistic ritual in which a Greek was sacrificed and eaten in Jerusalem in the temple implying that it is the Jewish God who demands the sacrifice of humans. This unabated anti-Jewish propaganda cannot have failed to have a dramatic effect. 
as we ourselves can witness in our own day, days, in a continual and unabashed stream of anti-Jewish propaganda, however full of obvious lies and slander it may be, including the nonsense of the protocols of the elders of Zion, hatred is easily sown. But it needs a trigger to set it off, and triggers were not lacking in first century Alexandria. The explosive mixture of verbal anti-Semitism and political reality came into being with the Roman conquest of the Near East. The first factor was, the, was that the Alexandrian Jews sided with the Romans, sensing that they would gain privileges by that, which was true, but the price was higher than they had anticipated. The semi-autonomous status they received in Alexandria from the Romans gave rise to an enormous resentment among the Greeks, who felt that their city had lost its, its status, whereas the Jewish community had won prestige. The second trigger which actually put the spark to the tinder was the visit of the Jewish puppet king Agrippa to Alexandria with a pompous show of his armed bodyguard. This was too much for the frustrated Greek nationalists. In their midst was a people whom they regarded as foreigners, yes, <coughs> as barbarians. These were people who had no regards for the traditional gods of the civilized world whatsoever, <coughs> for they practiced an arrogant, exclusivist religion. And these unbearable separatists were not only full of hatred of humankind in general, what was even worse, every year they slaughtered a Greek in a cannibalistic ritual. When this scum of the world had the affront to hail a king of their own, while the Greeks had not even a modicum of self-rule in the city, the red line had been crossed, and their fury could no longer be contained. When they realized that the Roman governor, who was supposed to keep them in check, was himself in deep trouble because of the ascension of the new emperor, they grabbed their chance. They blackmailed the governor into connivance and vented their anger by attacking the Jews. L'histoire se répète. Not always. But as far as outbursts of hatred against the Jews are concerned, it does always, right up until the present day. Apparently, motives do not really matter. Jews always seem to be the ultimate other, the dangerous other, the stranger who threatens us by his or her difference. A common response to such a deeply felt threat is an armed attack on those others in order to reduce the tension caused by the phobic mystification of the outgroup by the turning of Jewish otherness into a monstrous conspiracy against humankind and the values shared by all civilized human beings. We witness the zenith, zenith, or should I say the nadir, of this sad history of hatred just over 60 years ago, but that this history goes as far back in time as I have told you today does not make one optimistic for the future. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, yes, please. Introduce yourself. Uh, <coughs> my name is Stephen Rosenberg. Am I allowed to disagree yeah. with the with the learned? Am I allowed to disagree with the learned speaker, <coughs> whom I think has given us a very interesting survey of the situation? But the situation changed radically between the Greeks and the Romans in Alexandria. And as you said, <coughs> the Jews had a certain status. I think they were called Hellenes. They were not the barbarian Egyptians. They were not absolutely the Greeks, but they were in between, as you said. Yeah. Now, this lasted, I think you mentioned as well, for 250, 300 years. So this kind of endemic anti-Semitism came about because the Jews were used as a scapegoat. And I think this is the point that I would ask if you agree with or not. It's a question of the scapegoat. Um, I think his name was Avilius Flaccus, was in fact praised by Philo at the beginning of his work. Yes, and, he, right. and he was a good guy, but he was used as an enemy of Caligula. He used the Jews as a scapegoat. And I think this has happened again and again. So would you agree that I don't think there is this, we have to accept 
this endemic hatred of the Jews. The Jews are a separate people. We don't worship the same as the other people. We are therefore the other. We are therefore the different, different people. And therefore, unfortunately, again and again, when something goes wrong, we are the scapegoat. Yeah. Um, I'm totally in agreement with you when you say that this scapegoat factor plays uh, a significant role in, in the whole uh, situation that I have tried to describe. Sure. Uh, but um, that does not detract from the fact that there was this endemic hatred of the Jews. Of the, of the Jews on the part of, of many Greeks and Egyptians in, uh, in Alexandria. Uh, Philo says explicitly that there is this kind of e endemic hatred of the Jews because he says from the cradle onwards most people in Alexandria, in Alexandria are taught that Jews are bad people. And children are instilled with hatred of Jews and maybe he exaggerates a little bit but he could not write such a thing if that was totally not the case so I am inclined uh, to to take his words seriously that there is a long-standing history of hatred of the Jews uh, among the Alexandrians uh, I, I do not see why, why Philo what kind of reason Philo could have had to, to make that up uh, if, if it was not the case at all. So I think uh, both things are true and the endemic hatred uh, that had this long, especially Alexandrian history. Uh, by the way, it's, it's interesting to see that, that um, for instance, in, in, in uh, Asia Minor, uh, uh, Turkey, there were also from the, from the 4th or 3rd century BCE onwards large Jewish communities without there ever appearing this kind of, of endemic hatred of the Jews among the native population. You find that nowhere in, in, in Asia Minor, uh, uh, sometimes elsewhere, but always on a lesser, a much lesser scale than in Alexandria. Uh, so I think it has to do, it, um, I suggest it has to do with the fact that the Greek translation of, of Shemot, the book of Exodus, um, uh, what was was taken very ill by by the by the Alexandrians who saw themselves uh, painted there as as the scoundrels of history, and that that triggered this this counter movement, uh, which resulted in this whole variety of anti-Jewish versions of the Exodus, of which I summarized only two very briefly. So I think both both elements were there, and of course you are completely right that this scapegoat mechanism was at work in the situation as well. And maybe I should have stressed that somewhat more than I did. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, Dr. Avra Falk, then I have Judge Gabriel Bach, Rivka Duka Fishman, and... Thank you uh, for a very interesting lecture. I have just very... I know there are many other people who want to speak, so I'll be very brief. Just a, a methodological question and also then a psychological question. The methodological one is about the use of terms such as uh, pogrom and anti-Semitism uh, in about events that happened many, many years before these terms actually came into being in modern discourse and ghetto and so on. Those terms are belong to the modern era, the, the early modern and late modern era, and not to antiquity. So the question is whether it's not anachronistic to use such terms uh, when speaking about things that happened uh, almost 2,000 years ago. The psychological question is um, whether, in addition to scapegoating, there was not also the problem of what uh, Sigmund Freud called the narcissism of minor differences. In other words, the, the Jews of Alexandria were Hellenized, they spoke Greek, they had Greek customs. The only thing really that differed, that made them different from the Greeks was the religion. As uh, you quoted in some uh, early Roman and Greek writers who wrote about that. So uh, the question is whether there was not the uh, element of projection that played a part here, projection of things that were not acceptable to the Greeks upon the Jews, which is part of the scapegoating process. And also uh, whether there was a particular reason why in 38, in the year 38, in addition to the visit of Herod Agrippa and others, why the Greek community 
the non-Jewish Greek community, because the, the Jewish community is also <coughs> Greek in a sense. Why the non-Jewish Greek community uh, felt so threatened by that that they had to erupt in such violence. Thank you very much. Thank you for this question. I totally agree that my terminology is anachronistic. I'm aware of the fact that terms like pogrom and ghetto are, are modern terms. But uh, I did not uh, find it wrong to use them because uh, if you define the word pogrom as I did in the very first sentence of my lecture as uh, an organized and officially tolerated attack on Jews, then uh, this is what happened in Alexandria. And for that reason, uh, it is what in later terminology is called a pogrom. So why not use the term if there is, if there is a, a, a almost completely uh, identical phenomenon uh, taking place in antiquity. But if you say your terminology is anachronistic, then I can only plead guilty, yes. But I, I thought it, it was a good thing to do so uh, because it, the fact that the terminology is modern does not imply per se that it is a wrong description of the events of antiquity. Um, and as to your second remark, uh, I must confess that uh, my knowledge of modern psychology uh, does not suffice to to say whether or not you are right or wrong. So I'm, um, I take it for what you say and uh, and thank you for the remark. Judge Bach. Thank you very much for Thank you very much for your very interesting and fascinating lecture. Uh, I just wanted to ask. Are there any more or less established estimates as to how many Jews lived in, at that time in this Alexandria uh, area and how many were harmed, uh, I mean killed or, or, or wounded? I mean, more or less, are there any, any estimates as to the size and, uh, of that? And also, while the, uh, this uh, program was in, in process, did, the, did life inside the Jewish community continue more or less in an ordinary and, and, and harmonious way? Are there any, 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 is there any information as to, as, to, as to how that really influenced life inside the Jewish community? No? These are uh, important but difficult questions, I mean difficult to answer. Uh, the estimates of the number of Jews in ancient Alexandria uh, in scholarly, modern scholarly literature uh, very widely. Um, to give an idea, some uh, scholars uh, think that uh, there were less than 50,000 Jews in first century Alexandria and others speak about more than 150,000. Uh, that is to say that actually we, we do not know it and therefore I said around 100,000. That is not because I think uh, that we can be sure that there were uh, 100,000 but because I want to take a middle course uh, between the extremes uh, uh, in, in a matter in which I am not able to make my own decisions. I, you, you need a, an awful lot of demographic knowledge in order to, uh, to be sure about this kind of numbers. Uh, more important perhaps is the question how many Jews were the victims of, of, uh, of this violence. Uh, the problem is that Philo doesn't give any numbers about the victims and he is our only source. The only time he, he gives a number is when he says that the enemies uh, had destroyed uh, 400 Jewish houses. That's all. But I, I do not know how to come from this number of 400 houses to a reliable uh, uh, number of, of victims uh, we know for sure that there were more than 38 victims, be, uh, no, sorry, m more than 40 victims, because in one scene he tells us that uh, 40 members of the, the Jewish uh, Senate, the, 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 the Council of Elders of the community, uh, were killed in the local uh, theater, um, and, and there were many others. He says many, many others were killed, so it were definitely more than 40, but whether it's in the hundreds or in the thousands, I don't know. Nobody knows. And now, as to the sequel, yes, um, the, 
what, when the program is over, um, the, 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 the column that's, that was there for a time was, um, was only on the surface. Because uh, when in 41, the year 41, news about the death of Caligula reached Alexandria, then, as Josephus writes, the Jews immediately took up their arms and attacked the Greeks. And it took uh, strict measures and, and, uh, and uh, angry letters from the, from the new emperor, Claudius, to calm down this, the situation uh, more or less. But it, again, didn't last for long, because when in 66 the great Roman-Jewish war broke out in Judea, uh, after a couple of weeks, uh, the, 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 um, the hatred uh, between Jews and Greeks in Alexandria flared up again and there was a, a, huge, uh, a huge fighting uh, for several days and weeks uh, in, the, in the city uh, between Jews and Greeks in which according to Josephus tens of thousands of, of Jews and Greeks uh, were killed. And then again, in, in the year 115, there's a, this a big revolt uh, of Egyptian and other North African Jews uh, against the Greeks and Romans. And um, that's, uh, that war between 115 and 116 uh, ended in the almost total annihilation of Jewry in Egypt. And it takes uh, several centuries before Again, we hear something about small Jewish communities uh, in, in Egypt. But uh, the Egyptian Jewry was almost eradicated by the Emperor Trajan in 115-16. So uh, it is a, it, it, what started as a promising history, uh, this Judeo-Greek uh, cultural synthesis, ended in, in a series of dramas. I'd like to thank you for a uh, very enlightening talk. I have one question. Um, when we speak, of, you spoke of the philo-Semitic attitudes, of philo-Jewish attitudes of many of the Greek writers. And there was there, uh, in your, uh, do you also consider that there may have been a, a fear of Greeks and Romans of the attraction of Judaism? Uh, uh, Peter Schaeffer, the German historian, uh, he doesn't use the word anti-Semitism for this period. His book is called Judeophobia, and uh, it appeared in the late 1990s. And he speaks of this factor of attraction of Judaism. And as the Bible was an open book, and it was in Greek, it was accessible to the Greek reading public and, and the global Greek culture, it may very well have been highly attractive and therefore not only the anti-Jewish animus which you described so well, but also the kind of fear of being won over <coughs> to the Jewish side. Uh, is, this a, is this valid in your opinion? Oh, <coughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely sure. I, I, I could have given a whole lecture about this uh, attraction of Judaism for non-Jews in the ancient world, and um, it, we, we, have, we have many both literary and epigraphic testimonies to the fact that in, the, in many of the cities of the ancient world where Jewish communities were, that um, there was on the fringe of, of these communities a, 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 a whole group of people uh, who non-Jewish people who sympathize strongly with the Jewish community and who are often uh, 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 donateur, how do you say it? Donator? Donors? Donors. Donors. Uh, uh, who funded uh, Jewish synagogues or, or, um, or charitable institutions and, um, and these, well, they're officially they are called God-fearers, uh, the Teosabais or the Eresha Mayim or whatever, uh, the Metuentes in the Latin inscriptions. Uh, so these were uh, Gentiles who didn't become members of the Jewish community, but who were impressed by the Jewish religion, especially by its ethical aspect, 
and uh, who therefore sympathized uh, sometimes to a very high degree uh, with, with uh, Jewish ideas and values. And uh, that this phenomenon inspired a, a certain phobia, uh, a Judeophobia, is clear from several uh, ancient documents. For instance, when, when a Latin uh, author says, uh, look at that man, now he's, uh, now he's still only keeping the Sabbath, but the next step will be that he is going to circumcise his sons. So you, you see that this kind of remarks that this is of course about a, a, a non-Jew who keeps the Sabbath, that people in his, uh, in his uh, vicinity fear that the next step will be uh, becoming Jewish. So this kind of, 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 uh, of sentiments certainly played a role. So yeah, thank you for this. Uh, addition and correction, yeah. Uh, Professor Gottlieb, and final question, Edward Cohen there, yeah. Yes, I also want to thank you for the lecture. <coughs> uh, it was a great privilege to hear you, and uh, I defer to your expertise. Uh, and I wanted to mention, uh, uh, just very briefly, that um, even though uh, the phenomenon of scapegoating, which came up here, uh, it is uh, important, it's not uh, exactly the same phenomenon as anti-Semitism and that it can't be used as an explanation uh, because it, it, it is more uh, um, complex and is inserted in a more complex way uh, and uh, the phenomenon of scapegoating has to be interpreted in terms of the geopolitical context as well as the national context and uh, so I'm, I'm actually very interested in the phenomenon of scapegoating, and so uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's important. You have to be very careful when you discuss scapegoating uh, in connection with anti-Semitic uh, activities. And um, the other point being uh, that I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, Freudian, the Freudian approach uh, uh, has never been successfully extended to collectivities, and so it's a it's a it's simply a mistake to, uh, despite the book Civilization and its discontents, that uh, it's simply a mistake to uh, to apply it to in a, to a general population. It's, it was never meant to be, uh, by Freud to to be applied in this way, but um, and so there are other things. Uh, uh, I very rarely find such a brilliant uh, a scholar discussing this early history in the way that you did. And uh, I want to take advantage of it by asking you a question. Does uh, Philo mention uh, Christianity? Uh, and is there any evidence, because you also talk about Josephus who does, but is there, was there any evidence of this kind of influence at this particular time? Uh, uh, and I mean, I assume not, but uh, I, I wonder if you have any comments about Christianity in, in the mix.